What's up, everybody? Matt Kajewski here, back again with the Stochastic Channel. And today we're talking college football DFS ahead of week 10, the Friday slate, double header on deck. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. We are brought to you today by Prize Picks. They are a player prop based site. You're making lineups of player props with all of the major sports. NFL, NBA, NHL, college football, as well as a ton of niche sports. And better yet, they are offering you a first match deposit bonus up to $100 for new users. And they're going to give you one free month of Odd Shopper. Odd Shopper, the tool we have, everything sports betting, sides, totals, they're going to help you with that. And they have player props, which helps you directly over with prize picks. The link is in the video description below. You must be 21 years or older to play. If you or somebody you know has a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, Slate 10, Week 10, 2-Gamer. We're going to kick things off with Boston College taking on Syracuse. First and foremost, this is a slate with a bit of late news, which is going to be important. And we have some shifting roles for some of these teams. I'll try to dive into all that best I can. But let's kick things off with this game. Two and a half point spread in favor of the Orange. Bit of a losing streak for them since they started conference play, but a get right spot, if you will, according to the books. 50 and a half total. Boston College is 57th in pace. Syracuse is 30th. Boston College far run heavier, 41 and a half percent pass rate. Syracuse at 48%. A lot of that having to do with game script. They were run heavy in non con and have had to embrace the pass because of game script in recent conference games. I'll try to rank each player or at least say where they rank in the positional rankings as we do each team rather than at the end because it's a short slate. And that starts with Thomas Castellanos, the Boston College quarterback, who tops the slate at this position. And it's because of his mobility, 673 rushing yards this year. The guy's a monster on the ground. He has at least 12 designed attempts in four straight games. Third most recent game, he had 26 designed attempts, so there's a massive ceiling for Castellanos. And he's been pretty good as a passer, 193 yards per game on just 25 and a half attempts. The matchup isn't difficult against Syracuse. The floor with him is just too good to rank him anything other than number one. Ceiling could be debated. Some other guys maybe can eclipse that. But right away, safety-wise, Castellanos is top of the slate. Running back, this is our first late news situation. Pat Garwo hasn't played in two straight games with a leg injury. I don't think we see him, but that's far from a fact. You'll have to watch pregame. Boston College is good reporting, so you'll know this as long as you're searching his name. With him being out, Kai Robichaw, the Western Kentucky transfer, has handled most of the work. He's seen at least 24 touches in each of the games Garwo missed. A lot of that coming on the ground, but he also has been pretty involved in the past game. He has five targets in that span. He stands out as a solid price-adjusted play. But Alex Broom is involved as a change of pace, touch counts of six, and then, I mean, 20, excuse me, 19 in their most recent game. So there's a pretty decent ceiling with Broom, too. For a change of pace back, I think we can use him in tournaments. Probably not in the same lineup as Robichaw, but I think maybe that's something worth considering, and he's certainly a good tournament leverage play. A lot of the other backs are going to be more owned. The next late new situation is in the receiving room for Boston College. Ryan O'Keefe had the neck injury, hasn't played in three straight games. Last week, the coaching staff called him doubtful, but they said he's progressing in practice. I think that gives him a better chance to play here, but it's far from a guarantee. He is practicing at least in some capacity, and they're taking it day by day with O'Keefe. He would immediately become their wide receiver one, assuming he's healthy. In his place, Joseph Griffin has handled this for the most part. It's not a prolific passing attack, so sometimes the targets are a little variant. But as far as routes go, he's been the most consistent route getter on the team. Above 90% of the route share in three of the last four. Most recently, he was at 78%. So not quite the same decline that we've seen from other players. One such player that had a pretty big decline was Lewis Bond. 90% of the routes in three straight and dropped to 63 last game. That came with Dino Tomlin seeing a pretty big role increase. Since the injury to Ryan O'Keefe, he's been the third receiver. His routes have gone 63%, 65%, all the way to 81 last week. 
Not the most targeted, but for a cheap dart throw, Dino Tomlin is someone we can use. And we also saw Jaden Williams back in the rotation. 56% of the routes, that was after he had 16% the week prior. That speaks to just the rotation Boston College used, not always using Lewis Bond as a full-time receiver. Lastly, they got their freshman Jaden Skeet involved too, went from 3% of the routes to 22%. Nothing we want to play for DFS, but it does impact Lewis Bond, Jaden Williams. Apparently, Dino Tomlin's not affected by this, but that's at least worth noting. The other injury situation to monitor is George Takix, the tight end, didn't play last week. His routes had been dropping, kind of with Jeremiah Franklin playing more, but without Takix, Jeremiah Franklin had a 75% route share. So if he's out, Franklin could be another guy we look to as a pure punt option at 3,100. On the Syracuse side, Garrett Schrader is the quarterback. I mean, he's just been victim of terrible matchups recently, and I don't think Syracuse is any juggernaut, but this might be the best matchup for them the rest of the way. They're favored, which should help Schrader. He's another dual threat signal caller with 316 cumulative yards this year. Averages 188 and a half as a passer. He's not quite as involved on the ground as Castellanos. For reference, he's been below 10 designed attempts in four straight games. So safety-wise, I prefer Castellanos. But Schrader, he pretty clearly stands out as the quarterback too, which is a much better game environment than the second game we'll talk about. So two line, or excuse me, one lineup, I'm playing both these signal callers, probably playing a BC running back, and then looking to Joseph Griffin and Dino Tomlin, maybe Franklin for value. In the backfield, LaQuint Allen's also been a victim of game script. I mean, non-con, this guy was a pure bell cow. He's averaging 18.4 touches per game. Boston College allows 4.4 yards per carry. Their defense is not good outside the top 100 in run defense. It's finally a get-right spot for LaQuint Allen. He also had a route share north of 80% last game, so we're talking about almost an every-down player. Even though it hasn't looked great recently, I still think we can get back to him. Receiver's tough for this team. The big news is Umari Hatcher took a big hit last week, left the game, presumably a concussion. They call it a head injury. I don't know what else it would be, but seeing him play on you know a week's rest, it's a little bit hard for me to envision, but that's another injury status we need to monitor. Without him, I think they pretty clearly run Damian Alford, Donovan Brown, and Isaiah Jones as their three receivers. Jones didn't see a target last game, but his route share was still 70%. We didn't get a discount on Jones, so I would rather play Damian Alford, who has seven targets in two straight games, and then maybe looking to a Donovan Brown, Isaiah Jones as a value piece. Daryl Gill's routes were snapped with Isaiah Jones returning. Valari's their tight end, but he'll rotate a little bit. Sometimes they use four wide. He's not the most involved tight end. Second game, we have Colorado State taking on Wyoming, and what a clash of styles we have here. Six and a half point spread in favor of Wyoming. And the total's 41, largely based on defensive play, but Colorado State runs the air raid seventh in pace, 65, nearly 66% pass rate. Wyoming's 120th in pace with a 45% pass rate. We'll start with Colorado State. I think both quarterbacks are more in your GPP range. Braden Fowler Nicolosi is averaging 309 passing yards per game on 41 attempts. The problem is he does take sacks and he doesn't run. Negative 14 yards on the year for BFN. And this is a tougher matchup. We've seen him in shootouts and now the total's at 41. Wyoming plays excellent pass defense. So just in comparison, I would rather play Schrader and Castellanos. But for tournaments, having a quarterback with 300-yard upside needs to be considered. The backfield here. Another late news situation, Kobe Johnson's been out for three straight games. Avery Morrow played last week, even though he didn't touch the ball. Just a couple snaps for him, though, which meant Van Shield was basically a feature back. 13 carries for Van Shield, three targets. He's the player I would prefer to get to, but just watch for any sort of late news. If Morrow's like running with the first team or something, then I would have more interest in Morrow. He had been ahead of Van Shield prior to the injury. But I think just for safety purposes, Van Shield is the guy we want to get to. And for reference, I'd rather play the Boston College backs, and I'd certainly rather play LaQuint Allen. I'd also rather play Harrison Whaley, who we'll talk about in a second. I think the biggest news on the slate overall is the status of Torrey Horton. He's clearly been injured for a few weeks now. He was injured coming into the game. Almost immediately, he was on and off the field, and then he ended up leaving for good. 
later in the game. I just don't know if we see Torrey Horton. Reporting is good from Colorado State, so you'll know if he's warming up, but you'll still have to question his role. Is he a risk of re-aggravation? I personally think yes, because we've seen it multiple times now. Like, the guy's a warrior. He's just playing through injury, but I don't know. He might not play the whole game here if he aggravates it. He might not play at all. The one thing we can say is tight end Dallin Holker's not affected by this at all. The guy's averaging 77 yards per game, and he's double-digit targets in three of the last four. 9.8 9.8 targets per game in that span. He's your safest Colorado State option. If Torrey Horton misses, I would have more interest in Lewis Brown, Justice Ross Simmons, and Dylan Goffney. The two players that aren't really that affected by Horton are Lewis Brown and Justice Ross Simmons. They're full-time players regardless. The only thing that really happens if Horton misses is you see more targets for those two. But the real beneficiary of Horton's potential absence is Dylan Goffney. He goes from being, you know, a 30% route share playing person to like 70%. Last week, he eclipsed that with Horton in and out of the game. So Goffney, he would become a player we could potentially look at if Torrey Horton misses. For Wyoming, not a ton of interest in Andrew Peasley. Really, he's just in the conversation because it's a two-game slate. But the offense isn't dynamic. He's a game manager. Does have some mobility with 186 yards, but only averages 150 and a half as a passer. So I think he's still quarterback four on this slate. Just not a lot of ceiling for him at this price. But two game slate, we have to at least consider him. In the run game, Harrison Whaley returned from injury. He should be in line for a much larger workload after this Wyoming team just got blown out by Boise State almost immediately. On the year, he averages 18.2 touches per game, 111 and a half rushing yards. Some pass game work too, seven targets on the year. And again, he's missed time. So I think better days ahead for Whaley, especially in this game as almost a touchdown favorite, whereas last week only saw 10 carries. They got down immediately in that game. And lastly, the Wyoming receiving attack, not really interesting. Same reasons as the quarterback situation. If I'm playing one of these guys, it's probably Wyatt Wieland or their tight end, Trayton Welch, the two most targeted players on the team. But nobody has more than 250 receiving yards on the year. That's under 32 yards per game. Just a GPP situation because it's a two-game slate. Beyond that, John Michael Gillenborg, their tight end two, is third in targets. Ayer Asante, he's their wide receiver too. But you'll see a lot of guys mix in here. Ryan Marquez, Devin Bodie, I mean, Alex Brown. They use a lot of ro- rotational receivers for this Wyoming team. By far the worst passing attack to target. If you want access to these tools, the data sheet you're looking at right now on the screen, we have it at Stochastic. The link's in the video description below. You can look at this sheet without having to pause, listen to my voice if you'd like, and you also get projections and ownership projections. The link is below if you'd like to take advantage of our data package, our DFS projection package. It's brought to you by me. I power the whole thing. So if you want to support, that's the best way to do so. If you've done that, thank you. But that'll do it for us today. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think of these two teams. If you have a question, reach out on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajeski. We'll be back tomorrow for the full main slate. So until then, good luck, everyone. We'll catch you next time.